Okay. You can okay. Start. Are you ready, Colin? Yeah. Great. Okay. Colin, tell us about your first experiences reading Austin. It was on the um, Leaving Cert course, which is what the high school, the final years in high school are called in Ireland. They put persuasion on. And I remember one of my friends, who wasn't really that interested in literature, being asked once if he wanted to read something aloud. And of his own volition, he took up the famous letter in Persuasion, which is so beautifully written and elegant, and, and you know, it's sort of pain in it. And he read it slowly with a sort of hushed voice, as though the beauty in it or the elegance in it had touched him. And uh, certainly the idea, the ideas in the book, I mean, the idea is the idea of repose, the idea of some people being worthy of our full sympathy and others not, interested me greatly and still do. She seems to me to have a great deal to teach us about structure, form, and tone in the novel. But she also maybe teaches us how to live that, um, that business of how um, a, a rich sensibility will somehow emerge from the self, even though the self might be shy or retiring, that somebody will notice it. And that the important thing to have in life is a rich private life, is, is, a, is a rich sensibility. I think that there's always a secret self within any self. And it was one of the things that she could portray very well, the sort of private life that someone retiring could have, which could have a great deal of feeling within it, an ability to be wounded, an ability to long for things and that they would exude this in various ways, not wholly successfully. And therefore, therefore, love could elude them for a while. There could be misunderstandings within that because of people's inability to show themselves. I think Pride and Prejudice would, would have to be my favorite novel. I, I, I think of the books as probably artistically the most perfect and, and the most satisfying and the one that you can learn most from. And, and, and if you wonder then who you would like best in that novel, Pride and Prejudice, well, I suppose you're meant to like Elizabeth best, but every time Lady Catherine de Bourgh opens her mouth, or every time Mrs. Bennet opens her mouth, I get a thrill of pure satisfaction. And, and I'm interested in this idea of, um, because I have really just written a version of Pride and Prejudice called Brooklyn. And in Brooklyn, there's a young woman who has a refined sensibility, who remains quiet when she should, who isn't good at asserting herself, but is very good at feeling things very deeply, and is often very polite to people. And one of the problems you have with such a character, who's in certain ways passive, who's happier reflecting on things than causing things to occur, what you'd need around that character are other characters whose colors are more garish. In other words, if you're drawing someone in shades of gray and using deeper grays and bits of black and bits of white and, and you're actually trying to get a lot of texture into that gray, what you need is a dash of red. And I, I found that um, in the book, I created two characters, one called Miss Kelly, otherwise known as Nettles Kelly, and the other woman, the landlady, Mrs. Kyo. And I simply gave them that every word they open their, they say, when they open their mouths, they say something so shockingly snobbish, so insulting, so stupid, with filled with flavor, that the reader is forced to sit up every time they appear. And I, I based them very much, or at least I based how they were to play in the novel on the way that Austen plays with um, the voices of Mrs. Bennett and Lady Catherine de Bourgh. I think she remains popular because nothing much has changed. That um, one of the problems about love, for example, is that you're never sure. Um, that, that initial business of meeting somebody or seeing somebody and not knowing if it's going to work or not, that will never go away. I mean, that's, um, that's what Adam felt about Eve, you know, and uh, so that almost everyone's life story is that story of those months or those days or even hours, I mean, things are moving faster nowadays, especially in certain cities, when you simply didn't know if the um, 
object of desire wanted to sleep with you or not, or marry you, or spend their sort of lives with you, or, or go to Spain with you on their holidays. You know, that, in other words, that tension within love, that waiting and watching, and that hope that things will be resolved um, simply won't go away. And, and also, the not that is love, the levels of misunderstanding, and how things might be worked out. So, and also, people having foolish parents, foolish aunts, foolish sisters, um, and also people not being recognized, the sense of people having an inner self that doesn't emerge properly in the eyes or the face or the body, and the distance between the inner self and the outer self. I think all of those things are dramatized superbly in Austin. Tom, thank you very much. Thank you. Can I stop looking at this now? Yeah. Okay. Wow, you will. The, the first, I did, uh, I don't know, a hundred of these screen tests. You're the only one who never, ever looked at anyone else. <laughs> <laughs>